Okay, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So, my name is Guneet. I live in Delhi. I've always lived in Delhi. Um, and I work as a information technology consultant, which is a fancy word for a software engineer who doesn't work for one single company. Uh, and I am kind of related to the movements, different political and social movements in Delhi. Uh, also in the technology space, so I like to um, work on things related to the open source, open access, open data, then uh, issues of uh, related to gender rights, women's rights, feminism, uh, but of course I approach all of these with my uh, privileged background which is an upper class and upper caste male background um, and apart from that uh, I hold uh, political views of the nature of anarchism and maybe anarchist, uh, anarchist uh, syndicalism uh, I'm influenced by uh, Chomsky and um, I've read some Bakunin, I've read some uh, anarcha feminist literature, uh, Emma Goldman and stuff. Um, yeah, and I have not been academically trained in anything related to politics or social science and social studies. Uh, my training has and my work is related to the to, to information technology, which uh, by in its itself is very control much controlled by the industry, so it's very monotonous, very straightforward. So my views come from my own personal endeavors in reading and uh, reading literature regarding these issues and these political movements. So what got you into these politics? You mentioned some of your, and how does it relate to like the situation here in India? Um, situation here in India is very complex and it's very easy, much like America, to be not politically conscious. Because, because it's like a, like a phrase, the rat race. People are trying to survive, people are trying to make more money, people are trying to get constantly better jobs, better livelihoods, better off uh, houses and cars. And the whole capitalist structure is very much alive here with its, all its uh, hegemonic practices of controlling education, advertising, media and so on. So it's very easy to live a non-politically conscious life uh, in India. But in the last few years, there has been a sort of polarization uh, among people who hold uh, views that are not popular, not common among the upper class and the upper caste. Uh, and I'm saying this because obviously I'm just looking at through my lifetime. Uh, India has always been very politically charged. There have always been uh, left, uh, leftist movements, uh, factions and campaigns and political parties since a long time, since the very independence of this country 70 years ago. Uh, my involvement was through what I used to work on six, seven years ago, which was I used to design websites mm. for uh, businesses and slowly I I tried to understand what is the relevance of my work in this society how does it how does it make sense uh, what am I even trying to do from there I started engaging with some literature uh, which was something very new for me and my first uh, interaction with these with these political thoughts and uh, movements was in the women's rights thing. Um, yeah, so, and actually not women's rights. It's actually environmentalism, which is uh, which is in the, 
which is basically in our faces through organizations like Greenpeace and so on. So it was that was my first thing, but then I started to engage with uh, heavily engage with uh, women's rights and feminist uh, uh, groups and movements. My understanding was very limited as a male, as an upper class male. Uh, I helped organize a slut walk in Delhi, which was uh, which was maybe misdirected, which is premature in a way, but uh, it was at least it was a kickstarter for me to explore this side heavily. And in all of this, I was trying to find the intersection of internet and web technology to all of these political thoughts, which has now given me a clear idea of what it means, what open source means to me, what open data means to me, what open access means to me, because these are personal things that I've explored and understood myself. I've not been taught. I don't hold these views because I attended a, a class for six months or I was forced to read these books. These are my own personal uh, views. So they inform my professional life as well, my professional goals and objectives in life. And so yes, my political views are very close to what I do, which is technology. And I try to keep it very, or I want to, not sure if I'm succeeding, I want to keep it as relevant as possible to the current affairs of this country and this world. So, yeah. How, how does it relate to uh, the current situation, to in India as a well? whole? Um, uh, you mentioned. Uh, you know, cast um, and also like the history of resistance here in India, you know, against colonialism, mm. you know, and how has that influenced the politics here? My politics? Your politics, yeah. Um, so it's been a very, like, I think almost every day I'm learning new things about this country's or the people of this land their history uh, and it's informing my politics and it's gradually uh, shifting it started off with a very idealistic view of and as maybe still hold it um, that we should maybe just throw away capitalism patriarchy and stuff and a lot of things will be solved but it is not uh, as I've interacted with uh, people around me, with, the, with the, the, the politics, and when I say politics now, I mean electoral politics of uh, uh, struggling to get votes for a political party. Uh, as I've seen that evolve, and now that there's a very right wing government in the center, it has definitely changed my views and inform me what needs to be done both pragmatically which is like immediate response and in a sense idealistically in a long uh, long term objective where do we want to see ourselves maybe 10 years 20 years down the line so what kind of things do we need to do today to establish a, a, a framework in which we could achieve those things so one example I could give is that if, for example, today we fight for or advocate, quote unquote advocate, for uh, an open data policy in our governments, that all data that the government <laughs> collects or generates, if it's not personal in nature, should be released in the open domain, that could lay foundation for a more uh, more uh, decentralized, more equitable society and governance uh, maybe 10 years, 20 years from now. Um, so therefore, to sum it up, if the, the, the 
current affairs of this country, the things that I learn every day, essentially forces me to think of what I am doing with my work in technology and how can it immediately shape the future and what is the future that I want to see. And in that sense, so there are a lot of uh, people I've also connected to her who are like-minded and uh, which I used to be, when I was in college studying whatever I studied, I had no connection to such people, they had such thoughts, such ideas. But it rapidly changed in a couple of years after my education ended, basically trying to prove that education was the barrier for me. My education was particularly a barrier for me to to touch these uh, ideas, thoughts and people or interact with them. You mentioned um, uh, the future and how you want that to look like. I mean, can you explain, get into that, like how, how do we get there and how does it look? Uh, that's a good question. Um, now, because I hold anarchist views, I would want a future in which uh, there is a lot of worker control in production and now there is a, not just production, there is also services, a lot of services built on technology. So it's not just manufacturing and production anymore. But if we put them all together, so if there's more control of the people who do those things, how they govern themselves. So in a sense, um, in a sense, a decentralized form of organization, which challenges ex existing authority at all times, which is able to challenge because it has a framework within which it, it does. Uh, and continuously tries, is able to adapt to new issues like, for example, environment, for example, climate change, for example, uh, yeah, migration of people from urban to rural areas. How do we deal with that? And every quote unquote the industry of sec or sector of work is be is democratically controlled by the people who run it. That would be a very wonderful vision to work towards. Now, the thing, a disclaimer here is the framework which allows you to do this uh, or achieve these is probably a set of universal principles, almost like human rights that we have. And maybe we need to elaborate them further. So. So this, I feel there needs to be a common factor between all of these prob collectives, unions, syndicates, whatever you want to call them. The common factor being we need to uphold certain rights of people and then try to organize cells in our particular context, particular regions to administer resources, human resources, natural resources, and energy and so on to of society. Another disclaimer would be that it's not as straightforward as that because there are social is issues of caste and race, of uh, gender. These social issues cannot just get fixed automatically. Like if you change the economic system, probably you can change uh, race and caste issues. I do not think so. These need direct and explicit intervention and uh, action. So if you're going to work towards something like a more equitable society, then you cannot just do it by economic or political reform. It has to be a social uh, action on, on society's well, uh, inherent problems that we've seen. So I think that's the kind of vision or vision I have in the future. Right on. Um, how does um, how can 
anarcho syndicalism or like uh, anarcho communism work here in India when there is like a caste system? Uh, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, how do you deal with the caste system? Yeah. Hmm, so. That's a that's how do we deal with caste system? Yeah. And now I'm answering this as an upper caste. Uh, I think the agenda has already been set by the people who suffer because of the caste system. So we need to be not allies but accomplices in that. Uh, we need to fight the same fights, not just sit in the background and say, all right, we, we, we support you in solidarity. Of mm -hmm. course, that is there. But we need to fight for the same things. So for one example I could take, the caste system has resulted in an informal domestic labor system in India. So therefore we have uh, housemaids, servants, uh, janitors, cleaners, guards, security guards, who come from the lower caste or the casteless uh, segment of the society. And we do not have any uh, policies, acts, or laws to protect their rights as workers. So I think if the agenda asks us to, asks me to as an upper caste person, I need to politically and socially work towards establishing of acts and lo uh, laws that protect those, their worker rights. So things like minimum wage, health insurance, uh, leave policies, contractual agree uh, permanent contractual agreements and so on. So this is not a work of just an ally. Of course the people who are Dalits, people who are from these oppressed castes are going to work towards it, but that's not enough. I think even the upper caste needs to seriously take up that mantle and do it under probably an overarching uh, direction given by the oppressed because they understand the context so much better than people sitting in fancy houses in Delhi. Uh, yeah. So that's one way, it's a very complex way of solving caste. Uh, there are many more ways, there are legal ways, there are uh, non-legal ways which we are seeing already in practice and uh, I think the problem is that people get really polarized there's no one in the middle now anymore this either against or for so there is very little hope to convert people towards one side, say, okay, this is an actual problem, you sh should start supporting and fighting for the oppressed. Instead, what you get an answer would be, all that is bullshit, that all that is made up by the opposition political parties and, and you know, other Brahmanical statements that are visible in media all the time. Yeah, that's what I think. And you know, part of that means what opposing the like. There's a like a fascist government at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. like, um, so is that like part of the strategy too, like combat, like fighting them? Or how how do you fight fascism here in India too? Again, you have to fight them in many ways, not just one, and they're all in context, uh, in whatever way. Such so I am honored or privileged to be in touch with people or interact with people fighting this fascism in different ways. One is on the ground where you're trying to organize people, unite people, so from marches, act, uh, protests and so on. So uh, they organize that. There are people in, in news media, journalists who are trying to speak truth to power. Uh, there are people within uh, the bureaucracy and the government trying to push for better laws and legal uh, constitutional rights 
then there are obviously lawyers fighting the good fight in the biggest courts not that the court system is any uh, not that it's a divine sanctimonious place it's also uh, ridden with human subjective problems but still that fight needs to be fought uh, there are people in the private sector working for corporations trying to demand uh, better workspaces more uh, better protection of rights uh, from lgbt uh, and queer folk from the dalits i see all of them trying to engage with these quote and quote mainstream uh, systems trying to change them alter them to make them more uh, open and equitable hmm. um is there like a police repression or or police violence state violence against these movements yes how it definitely is like uh, like some examples of that how is, what is it um one recent example comes from the student politics political movement in delhi or oh, actually all over india uh so there are some universities here that allow or provide that safe space of freedom or a free space to challenge the established authorities or at least develop views or language to challenge these authorities um and the fascist government in the center has essentially tried to alter these spaces by uh, intervening in their administration systems appointing vice chancellors or professor or headmasters and principals who would try and thwart these spaces and this dialogue so the police is the weapon that is used to enforce this uh the police uh, is essentially a pawn of the political and the ruling elite um coincidentally when you interact with the police or the police men and women they belong to the same most of them belong to the same uh oppressed classes and castes and yet and much like in probably in america they um uh, fight the fight from the side of the established authority so it's a bit of a complex thing the police come from the lower caste or the upper caste or a um, lot of the brunt work the the constables and they come from the lower castes hmm. not particularly dalits but lower castes hmm. uh lot of our army comes from that hmm. and it's it's probably probably a stable more stable livelihood not saying it's a sufficient livelihood or sustainable livelihood that is why a lot of uh men and women choose this but uh, it's a very complex thing and the fact of the matter is there is police violence the police is used to suppress voices freedom uh they're not particularly there to help people when they suffer loss or something i myself am a testament to that i know how police reacts to something like a for example a, a robbery in an upper caste upper class person's house as compared to a robbery in a poor person's house so i'm very well aware of that because uh, i faced it myself and same thing applies for how when the fascist forces try for example today today itself uh, the student wing of the fascist forces they try to raid the amnesty office in probably bangalore and and uh, the police usually is used in for example in places like kashmir or in the northeast to you know uh 
push back the rioters, the protesters. They use pellet guns. They use uh, water cannons and tear gas and whatever. And but when the fascist forces do it, none of that is mm. used by the state. So therefore, it is very easy to conclude that it is a pawn in the state's machinery. And they've killed some protesters too, right? Yeah. Um, any like any final thoughts or statement that you want to give to the people in, I guess, what um, it's called the U.S.? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's very important for us to somehow form formal or informal ties across borders to be able to have a stronger international force, almost like the international. Uh, but of course there are problems within the left, there are factions within the left. All of these need to be addressed. Uh, some decades ago, when the Dalits or the women uh, rights groups within the left tried to wash their concerns, they were suppressed by saying, no, we need to unite on the same front to tackle the fascist forces. Therefore, causing a, right, uh, uh, a separation between the two. So we need to be very, very careful of that, that even though we're forming these larger uh, organizations or bodies or collectives that try to fight global fascism and capitalism, we need enough free democratic spaces within for all kinds of voices to thrive, for all kinds of voices to organize and uh, in their own way challenge uh, authoritative forces, capitalist patriarchal forces. So yeah, I think it would be very important for different the left-leaning individuals to connect with each other across borders. Because we, we are actually doing that in the mainstream, thanks to things like Facebook and Google. And therefore, we need to use the same spaces and make and alter them and, and make them uh, more democratic and so on. I'm talking now a little bit on the technology side, but still, it makes sense to me. Right on. Thank you. No problem.